This video is going to serve as an introduction to our unit on animal diversity. Before we can start talking about the different types of animals, we need to frame our discussion, just like we did for plants, starting with what is an animal and where did they come from? Like plants, our best evidence comes from the hypothesis that animals evolved from some aggregate of animal-like protists. These colonial heterotrophic protists may have evolved into a multicellular organism, some early proto-animal, with the development of cell specialization. When certain cells started to become specialized for different tasks, they became interdependent. While the cells could no longer live independently, they became more efficient at what they do. Eventually, we see the specialized cell types form tissues, then complex organs, and then organ systems. So what do you think of when you think of animals? Probably something like this. How about something like this? Or this? Or this? Or this? But what about this? Or this? Or this? Or this? You might not think about those. And don't forget about these guys. And these guys. So you can see, we have a lot of ground to cover if we want to talk about how we understand what are animals. We will see that like plants, we start in the water and eventually move on to land. We will have to overcome the same hurdles that we addressed in plant evolution in getting larger and becoming more complex while becoming less reliant on water. But let's think about this in a systematic way, starting with what is an animal? What are the basic characteristics? How would you define an animal? Well, I think we'd better start with that they are eukaryotic and multicellular. That's a basic animal characteristic. Also, heterotrophic and aerobic. Well, that eliminates a lot of possible kingdoms that they could be. Certainly aren't a bacteria or a protist or a plant but we need one more characteristic. How about no cell wall? Those are the primary characteristics that are required for something to be an animal. But there are other animal characteristics. All animals at some point during their life have some motility they can move. Maybe not in their adult form, but at some point. In animals, uh, unlike some of the plants and fungus that we saw, when we're looking at an animal, you're seeing the diploid body form. And there are two types of tissue that are unique to animals that we don't see in other type of organisms. And this nervous tissue and muscle tissue. Those are uniquely animal. As we move through animals, from the more simplistic to the more complex, we'll be looking for evolutionarily significant changes. We'll be looking for changes in body symmetry and cephalization, having a head. We will look at the presence and type of body cavities. And we will point out and discuss the major divergence that took place in the more complex animals. We'll also be looking at some comparative anatomy as we explore the rise of more complex organs and organ systems such as nervous systems, gas exchange systems, excretion systems, digestive systems, circulatory systems, and reproductive systems. Before we begin, I want you to have out your note packet so you can pause the video and write down notes as we proceed. Also, we will be building a classification tree along the way, similar to what we built in plants if you recall something like this. So I want you to have a blank piece of paper uh, so as we move through we can build a classification key with animals. You should start with this at the bottom. As we move along we'll continue to build up uh, a chart for the diversity of animals. The first question we need to ask is does this animal have true tissue? There's a distinct, distinct, is there a distinct division of labor among the cells? If the answer is no, we have a group of animals called the parazoa. The word parazoa, para means alongside of, zoa means animals. An example of the parazoa are sponges. These are animals, but they're very simple and they lack true tissues. So let's add that to our chart. So the question is, do we have true tissues? If the answer is no, we go this direction. If the answer is yes, we go this direction. And the example of the animal that we have down this branch are the periphera. 
or the sponges, porifera, filled with holes or pores. Now the branch of animals that have two tissues we're going to subdivide again, based upon two different things. One, if they have tissues, how many layers of tissues do they have, and two, what type of symmetry do they show? Now we need to stop here and investigate what we mean by a number of tissue layers and symmetry. So let's go to this page. Early in animal development, we start out as a single cell. And that cell divides and eventually ends up as a hollow ball of cells. This is just one layer of tissue. But during the process of gastrulation, that tissue, that ball of cells, rolls in on itself. The process is called gastrulation. And it produces this uh, cavity called the archenteron, which is a primitive gut, the precursor to the digestive system. The opening to that cavity that we see right here is called the blastopore. But what this creates for us is two distinct germ layers. We have uh, an inner layer of cells called the endoderm and an outer layer of cells called the ectoderm. The endoderm is going to eventually give rise to the organs of the digestive system. This is the primitive gut. And the ectoderm is going to eventually give rise to the outer layer of tissue, the skin, and also the nervous system. Now, in some animals, there's a third layer of tissue that develops called the mesoderm. Meso meaning middle. We can see that in this picture, the red is the mesoderm. And that'll give us three germ layers. And the mesoderm will eventually give rise to generate the tissues and organs and organ systems such as muscle and skeletal and reproductive system and others. So going back to our classification tree, if we determine that our animal has true tissues, then the next question we ask is how many tissue layers? Two, endoderm, ectoderm, or three, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Animals with only two germ layers we call diploblastic. Animals with three germ layers we call triploblastic. Now before we go any further, we need to also take into account another important characteristic of animals, and that's the idea of symmetry. The sponges, or the periphera, the parazoa, are asymmetrical. They lack symmetry, meaning there's no place that you could draw a line that would divide this exactly in two mirrored halves. Among the animals that have true tissues, we can uh, divide them based on a type of symmetry. They have either radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry. A sea anemone, for example, has radial symmetry and let's say an elephant uh, has bilateral symmetry. And what do we mean by that? Well, an animal that's radially symmetrical can be divided into mirrored halves by making it a vertical plane as long as it passes through the central axis. A bilateral animal is two-sided, bilateral, and there's one plane in which you can divide it into two mirrored halves. The animals that are diploblastic or have two germ layers are also radially symmetrical, and the animals that are triploblastic, having three germ layers, are bilateral, with one exception. So we can go back to our classification tree and add that piece of information. The animals that lack true tissues are asymmetrical. The diploblastic animals, or the animals with two germ layers, are radially symmetrical. And the three germ layer animals that have true tissues are bilateral. Now there's another characteristic that we'll talk about in animal diversity. And that's cephalization, which is the presence of a head. Now you might think, of course, all animals have a head. But I'd remind you of these few pictures. This one, and this one. Uh, maybe this one and this one or this one and this one. These animals don't have heads. And what is a head? And where would you put it on an animal? What characteristics do you think of when you think of a head? Stop the video and write down how you define the term head as for animals. I would define a head as an area of the body with a concentration of sensory and feeding structures. So where would you put the head up on an animal? Right, in the front. But what about an animal that doesn't have a front? 
Do radio animals have heads? Are they cephalized? Well, that's only one piece of the puzzle as to why and if an animal has a head. Because we can find bilateral animals without heads too, but that's for later. So back to our chart. We're done with the building of this line for the radial, but on the bilateral line or the triploblastic line, we get to another branch we have to ask ourselves a question about body cavity and type of body cavity. First of all, what is a body cavity? Well, think about where your major organs are. They're inside of your body, but they hang in open spaces within your body. We call these spaces body cavities, and they allow room for complex organs and organ systems. Not all animals have these spaces, and not all of these spaces are organized the same. Another name for body cavity is salome. A salome is a body cavity surrounded on all sides by mesoderm. Animals that lack a salome or lack a body cavity are called acelomates. In this picture you see this first drawing is an acelomate. The yellow represents the endoderm, the blue the mesoderm, and the red the ectoderm. And you see that the, meso the endoderm touches the mesoderm, which touches the, touches the ectoderm. There's no space. There's no body cavity. But in this drawing, you see, let me get a pen here, uh, this empty space here, where there's a gap between the endoderm and the mesoderm. So this is a body cavity. But it's not surrounded on all sides by mesoderm, blue. And here we see body cavity that's surrounded on all sides by mesoderm. So this type of an animal has a body cavity, but it's not a true salome. So we call this type of animal a pseudocelomate. Remove that. And here, this type of animal would be a coelomate. It has a body cavity surrounded on all sides by mesoderm. So we have three different body plans in animals no salome, no body cavity, a false salome, and a true salome. So back to our chart. If the answer to our question of body cavity is no, then we have the acelomates. If the answer is yes, that we do have a body cavity, which type? A pseudosalome or a true salome? When we get to coelomates, we are at a very significant place in the evolution and diversity of animals. We have true tissues, we have three layers of tissues, we have bilateral symmetry, we have a true body cavity for space for complex organs and systems. At this point in animal evolution, there is a distinct divergence between what we call the protostomes and the deuterostomes. This divergence is based upon a dis difference in the basic pattern of animal development. To see this difference, we need to go back to the creation of the archenteron, the primitive gut. If this opening right here is the first opening to our primitive gut, this cavity is going to be the digestive system, then this opening is one end of that system. It's either the mouth or the anus. The term protostome or deuterostome is really, see, really, really referencing the fate of this blastopore, what this opening will eventually become. In one branch of the coelomates, this blastopore will become the mouth, and the other branch, the fate of this blastopore, is to become the anus. Let's think of the word protostome and deuterostome for a moment. The prefix proto means first. The prefix deutero means second. And then stome, we should remember, means mouth. So protostome means first mouth. Deuterostome means second mouth. What does that mean? Well, if we look at the difference between protostomes and deuterostomes, and we look at the fate of the blastopore, as this animal continues to develop, and this digestive tract moves the whole way through, and we have two openings. If the blastopore, if its fate is to become the mouth, then the first opening, the blastopore, becomes the mouth, we have first mouth, or protostome. But if that blastopore's fate is to become the anus, and the second opening is to become the mouth, we have deuterostomes, or second mouth. 
There are other differences between protostomes and deuterostomes in how the mesoderm develops and in the original pattern of cell division. But for us, for now, this fate of the blastopore is the defining difference between in, within the divergence of coelomates, the protostome branch and the deuterostome branch. And so here we are. What we have to do in this unit is to go through, starting with periphera down here, and at each one of these boxes, fill in the type of animal that belongs in there, and discuss the evolutionary trends as we move up through our discussion of the diversity and evolutionary relationships among animals.